Hi, y'all. In this video, I'm going to discuss a case that's in the Washington State Supreme Court right now. It's on racism and the death penalty. I'm going to talk to you guys, but I'm hoping that some of the justices from the Washington State Supreme Court might happen upon this, because, you know, they watch things and maybe they'll run across it. So if you happen to be a justice of the, of the Washington State Supreme Court, please stick around. Uh, I have some information that you might want to just casually notice. All right, so um, the argument in, in the defense of this man, Mr. Gregory, is that... Uh, his death penalty should be overturned because jurors in Washington State and prosecutors in Washington State, we, we all are really, just a whole bunch of racists. So let's, uh, let's go through some things they brought up, like uh, something called the Beckett Study from a sociologist, and why this uh, so-called Beckett Study should not be given any weight by the court and should be categorically ignored because it's complete gibberish. It's complete nonsense. Anyway, so it starts off uh, with Ms. Uh, Silverstein talking about how confident the court can be in the goodness of this particular study, and she just misconstrues there what the uh, the confidence uh, uh, what the confidence level actually means. It doesn't tell you anything about the particular study you have in your hand. What it tells you is if you um, the percent of all possible samples of a population that can be expected to have um, the population's parameter uh, within it. So it doesn't tell you about this particular study. What it says is if you do many, many, many studies, you'll expect X percent of these to, uh, uh, of the uh, statistics to actually uh, approximate the population's parameter. You'll have intervals that have the population's parameter contained there within. But it's important to note, it tells you nothing about the study you have in your hand. Okay, uh, so then... Um, what I would argue is the probable cause to believe that uh, this lawyer, Mrs. Silverstein, uh, was uh, knowingly materially misrepresenting this study and uh, knowingly misleading the court. And this is for logical reasons, and I'll explain what they are. One, either she is sufficiently well-educated in statistics to know good statistics from bad statistics. In other words, she, she has a mastery of the subject to such a level that uh, she can opine in her own right about the goodness or badness of some statistical model or other in which case she has to know that this is complete garbage, or she doesn't have uh, that level of knowledge about statistics, and therefore she's not in a position to tell the court that this is a good study. In other words, she's using her ignorance of the field to license a positive claim testifying or op opining about the goodness of the research, a subject in which she's not qualified to render an opinion. So in either, either way you, you slice it, um, she has, she should know that what she is saying is false, and this is a breach of the ethics, and I would suggest that you uh, look at uh, giving her some sanctions for that. Anyway, so in order to know that this study is, is not a good one, you don't really need to look any further than the four, uh, the four corners of, what the, um, of the actual study, what, what the author of the study herself has said, for example, in footnote, on page, uh, footnote 10 on page 3 where she's talking about the fact that all the data that she analyzed uh, was given by uh, given to her by the uh, the the, um, the uh, client's lawyers, and that is all that she looked at. And she and she was talking about how there are cases missing uh, from from that data uh, that are missing to her knowledge. And she goes, uh, so uh, in part, in the relevant part, it reads: If this is correct, that these data that these uh, cases are missing, the data set analyzed in this report is incomplete, and it is thus and it is impossible to determine if there is any systematic bias in the sample of the cases analyzed. She knows that those cases are necessary for her work. She does not have those cases, and uh, therefore, because they are necessary to her work and she doesn't have them, then she's telling you right there in footnote 3, I'm sorry, in footnote 10 on page 3, that it's impossible to say really anything intelligent uh, based on what they do know. Um, this is also, on her part, professional incompetence. She knows who has these cases. She knows where to find these cases, and she did not go get the data uh, I wrote here over the discussed statistics. Oh, yeah. Uh, she's trying to do statistics when she doesn't have to. She could go get the parameter. She has the whole population at her disposal. disposal. You use statistics. Statistical methods are developed um, so that way you can take samples of a population, you get representative samples, and you can approximate the parameter of the population. You can, you can, you can infer things about the population based on a sample. Uh, but if you have the whole population at hand, it is professional incompetence not to look at that. Statistics is not the ideal way to go about analyzing data. It is a pr pragmatic concession to the fact that it is 
not feasible to go get the population on everything that you care to study, where the population is all of the relevant data. So because you can't do that, you, you develop techniques to find ways to represent that data, uh, to represent those data, to approximate those data, and then based off of these methods, you draw inferences about the population. It, it, so um, the proper thing to do if you're a researcher and you have the population, so you have all the data that could possibly exist that you would need to look at in order to say something about whatever it is you're talking about, and then you, you refuse to look at a large portion of it and say, no, we'll just do, we'll just, uh, do a, uh, some statistics here, we'll just take a sample, uh, that is not good. That is, that is intentionally in, in, uh, introducing into your work a source of error that could easily be avoided because all of the data that you actually need is actually within your reach. It is professional incompetence not to make use of it. Uh, in, anyway, um, so uh, further things that she says here on page 7, and this is demonstrating a, a problem in, in this, uh, this so-called scholar's understanding of statistics. But anyway, uh, we fitted a logistic regression model, each with an outcome of uh, 0 or 1, using maximum likelihood estimation procedures to estimate the probability of receiving the death penalty given a number of covariates. In general, MLE estimates should be interpreted with caution for samples with fewer than 100 cases. Now, Mrs. Silverstein said in court, um, uh, she, was, she was averring, this is a good scholar, this is a, a straightforward uh, application of textbook statistics. I know not from what textbook this woman reads, uh, but it, it must be like one of those special ones where it says whatever you want it to say. The author here is conceding that when the samples are under 100, you have to use caution. The reason you have to use caution is because when you don't have an adequate, uh, an adequate sample, to look at, you can't draw inferences of any reliability based off of that sample. You have insufficient information to draw an inference about the very thing you're claiming to model. That's the caution. So if you don't have a sample that's capable of giving you the type of predictive power that you require, the professionally competent thing to do is to not publish that study because you're not saying anything intelligent. So the author here is saying, if you read the textbook on this, and this has a a footnote where it goes to a textbook, it'll tell you that this is dangerous to do because of this, this problem. But it, it goes downhill from there. Uh, let's talk about reading a textbook. Uh, for example, uh, logistic regression, uh, applied logistical re regression by Hosmer and uh, Limshaw. This isn't simply a textbook on the subject, it is the textbook on the subject. Uh, it is the most cited textbook on the subject by statistic, uh, statisticians, of which this author of the study is not. She's a sociologist, which is a quasi-wannabe science. I'll justify that in a minute. And these are actual, st uh, David and Stanley uh, Hosmer and um, Limshow, Limshow are actual statisticians. This is what they do. One of them has studied this particular field uh, for his, uh, his whole career. Anyway, they wrote the book on this subject and what they say in this is we do not recommend routine publishing of what are uh, so-called pseudo r squared values uh, with results from fitted logistic models however they may be helpful in the model building state as a statistic to evaluate competing models so that's something for the researcher to pay attention to when trying to develop various models to look at something it is inappropriate to be published in a study as a general matter, and the reason for that is that pseudo R squared values uh, serve to confuse consumers of the data. You're introducing confusion where what you're trying to do is uh, impose clarity. This is, this is an author who has written a study and using uh, this particular, I think it's McFadden, she doesn't actually specify which of the competing pseudo R squared values she's using. I think it's McFadden's, but it could be one of the other ones, uh, which is imposing confusion. You, when you seek clarity, you don't want to go out of your way to impose confusion, like, for example, not looking at a, at a population when you have it readily available, and instead looking at a sample, and then trying to use a statistic to say something about the population, when you could just actually look on the next page and say something directly about the population. So you're introducing confusion there. You're introducing sources of error there you are introducing confusion here by disobeying the recommendation of the people who are the experts in this 
very uh, mode of analysis. It's page 167 from their second edition. Three pages earlier that the uh, pseudo R squared values we're talking about are based on various comparisons of predicted values from the fitted model to those from the base model, the no data or intercept only model, and as a result, do not assess goodness of fit. We think that a true measure of fit is one based strictly on a comparison of observed to predicted values from the fitted model. This is proper science. This is the touch on, the gold standard of real science. Come up with your models, look at your data, blah, blah, blah. But as Feynman has put it uh, so brilliantly, after you do all that, what you have to remember to do in all these cases is take your model and your analysis and your data, no matter how beautiful, how elegant, how wonderful, how brilliant, and compare it against the real world. And if they disagree, the model is wrong. Reality is always right. Always. It is always true. What really happens is, in fact, what really happens. So no matter how brilliant your model, how wonderful, how beautiful, how prestigious, how, how many people love your model, if the data, don't, if what the model predicts doesn't fit the data, the model is wrong. You either revise the model or you throw it away. Now the reason the pseudo R squared values are misleading is because they don't tell you anything about the data you're trying to predict. They tell you relative comparisons, one model to the next in a nested set of models which when you put in an R squared value, people are thinking that it's, a core, that it's telling you something about uh, how well your independent variable talks about your uh, dependent variable, which it simply doesn't. And moreover, the values uh, show up differently, so it might, uh, it, by the way, that could serve to confuse on either end. It could confuse by thinking it's telling you something about the data that it isn't, or it could confuse you by thinking that the, this, um, there's a weaker correlation than you would expect because the values turn out differently. It introduces all of this confusion, and the reason, one of the reasons it's confusing is there's not an intuitive way to describe how this works. There's not an easy way to describe what this value represents. It's very complex. It's best left in the hands of professional statisticians or experts on statistics who are dealing with this on the back end. And if you're going to publish it in a study, it should be a study for those people who actually have a good knowledge of these, these various things, as opposed to the consumer of these types of studies, a lawyer, as one of the justices put, uh, during, during the argument. We're not statisticians. How do we know? That's exactly right. Um, the lawyer, Ms. Silverstein, is not a statistician either, but she is representing that she understands it sufficiently well to license the goodness of the study, or she doesn't understand it that well and she's just blowing smoke out of her wherever when she says it's good. She doesn't have any way to distinguish good from bad. She's just licensing the claim it's good research in, in the face of her ignorance about whether it is or is not. And um, I've taken the liberty of uh, putting some stuff up here, uh, but I want to talk about Mr. Robinson, who was the ACLU lawyer, and mention it takes an awful lot of cheek for an attorney to stand up before a court and tell the court that a case the court recently heard and spent four hours, which is about six times, five or six times the amount of time spent on a normal appellate argument in our Supreme Court here, it spent six times that amount of time on this oral argument that such a case as that court had just heard, had recently heard, and is still pending, I think, uh, just doesn't exist in the state. That takes a lot of cheek or a great deal of incompetence to represent to a court that a case that's on their docket that they've recently heard just simply doesn't exist. And Justice Gonzalez was right when he asked the state, does such a case exist? And the state's attorney was uh, quite good in pointing out, well, there's the Shireman case, which you know, you've heard, it's, it, it fits the thing that he says it just doesn't exist. The argument was that if you're a white person and you kill four or five people, you just simply can't get the death penalty in Washington. It, just doesn't, it never happens. Uh, there's the case, the Shireman case, which is before the Supreme Court right now, where that did happen. But if you're a black man and you kill one person, you can. And that this is, anyway, it's just a whole bunch of gibberish. But let's look at their actual model and what it, in fact, predicts. And if you're in the Washington Supreme Court, you can... Uh, I, well, I won't go into a great deal of detail, I'll just point out some logical issues here and why you get this kind of gibberish. The reason you get this kind of gibberish is because in the social, so-called sciences, unlike in the real sciences, there are two different models for how people come to make it through mathematics courses. Uh, this is why Tom Lehrer refers to the liberal arts track, the, that side of the house, as mathematics for tenors. He is a brilliant satirist, but I don't cite him as a satirist qua satirist. I cite him as a satirist qua 
extremely good mathematician. He's taught mathematics at Harvard. He's taught mathematics at MIT and other places. He is an extremely competent and extremely good mathematician who happens to have a wicked sense of humor and can launch a, a, a one-liner burn on people in the drop of a hat. So mathematics for tenders is what you get in courses like sociology and psychology. They don't take science, the science track, in mathematics. The, the distinction between the two branches is that on the science track, if you want to be an engineer, a mathematician, or work in uh, the natural sciences like computer science or physics or chemistry, something along those lines, um, we work very hard to weed out stupid people. It, it is one of, the, one of the objectives of the way the courses are designed, because if you can't make it through these weed out courses, you stand no, no hope of furthering uh, human knowledge in the scientific enterprises, in the real sciences, in the, in the actual sciences. So these courses are designed to separate the sheep from the goats. They are designed to make sure that the third and fourth tier intellects are weeded out very early because it saves everybody money, it saves everybody a bunch of time, uh, a lot less stress, uh, all, well, you can imagine why you want to do that. On the other track, their job is to water down the curriculum and make it easy so that way people can pass who aren't good enough to understand the real important uh, parts of mathematics and who don't spend a significant part of their life really studying hard-nosed, rigorous, brutal mathematics where you learn, you are pushed up against your limits day in and day out because once you are graduated uh, and you go to grad school or you know, if you go further than that and go work as a professional science, scientist, mathematician, engineer, whatever, uh, that is going to be your professional life exceedingly hard problems that require a keen mind, sharp analytic skills, and an unrelenting quest to separate fact from fiction. You don't get that in the social so-called sciences. They want to help the, the mathematically disinclined to make it through courses that are, that are called good enough for what we do. And then they get out into the, into the community and they, and they actually will complain, overtly, about how it's unfair to expect of them the same kind of rigor you expect of uh, their colleagues and their, the other scientists, and by other scientists what they mean is the real scientists. The distinction between science and not is the rigor. It is the ethical implication and the standards of rigor, the unyielding demand for this kind of thing. That's what separates science from not. And the very thing that distinguishes a science from not a science is what they argue qualifies them to be uh, a social science. They're, they're trying, as Tom Lehrer also said, sociologists and about sociologists in particular ever since they started talking about social science they've been trying very desperate to justify the word science and he was talking about sociology and he said uh, he was I was teaching mathematical modeling and statistics in the uh, some of the social courses at MIT he goes, we didn't have a sociology department we hadn't sunk that low but anyway um, so let's take their model and talk about a couple of statistical exploits that are being used here to again mislead the court. So here you have whites, blacks, and the other races. DPS for my gaming friends doesn't mean damage per second. This is a uh, death penalty sought by the prosecutor and this is people who have been executed. So for whites it's 34% sought, 12.4% uh, are executed. Blacks 27% sought, 16.1% executed. And for the other races it's 24% sought. For anyone who's competent with statistics you already know where I'm going. Uh, and then 7.8 of those are executed. So take uh, the null hypothesis here. The thing, the, the status quo, what we would like to assume is true, that racism does not determine uh, death sentences. It's not the driver there. Whatever is responsible for it is something other than race. And the thing we actually want to test is if racism is what causes these outcomes. So that's our alternate hypothesis, the, the, the thing that we're going to test. So what the uh, lawyers and the person they paid to prepare a study for them to present to the court, as opposed to publish in a journal somewhere, which wouldn't mean much in a sociology journal anyway, but whatever, <clears throat> is that based on the criteria they, <clears throat> excuse me, based on criteria they've come up with and the way they've broken down the data <clears throat> and on the, uh, the confidence, um, the level of significance they have chosen, God, I'm going to choke to death. Oh, is the death penalty attacking me? Oh, it's racism. It's a white board. It is that uh, <clears throat> whites in Washington are racist against black folks. And the way that you know it is you look at the various proportions. 
And based on the, the, all the different uh, factors they've come up with and where they've set the sensitivity or the significance level, uh, that you, this null hypothesis, you reject it if you meet that level and you have this disparity, uh, they claim you meet that level and therefore you reject it, that, uh, that racism doesn't drive sentences and therefore you fail to reject this, which for practical purposes means that's what you're accepting is true, is that racism does drive death sentences. Now, this is very interesting. But the logical problem here is that you can use their same breakdown of data to after you've proved that or implied that, that racism does cause it, is you can just uh, repeat the process and prove that the opposite is true, which I will now do. And I'm going to do that by the very handy tool of using how they've broken down the data and looking here at the other races. Whites are racist against the minorities, obviously. Uh, so let's see how this pans out on... on consistent criteria that they chose. I'm using what, how they chose to break down their data and uh, all, you know, uh, all their little protocols here. Is that you'll notice here it's 7.8%, 12.4, 24, 34, blah, blah, blah. So you re repeat that process and now you make this H0 the null hypothesis and you make that the alternate hypothesis. So racism does drive death sentences and for the same selection criteria they use uh, for that you reject this new null hypothesis, and then you fail to reject the new alternate hypothesis, which for practical purposes means that's what you're accepting, that's what you're saying is true, and you say that racism doesn't drive death sentences. Why is this possible? Because of uh, uh, something that happens in social sciences very frequently. It's called p-hacking. You arrange the data in such a way that it, 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 uh, it will predict what you want it to say. And this is most prevalent, or one of the most famous cases of this, is in a discrimination claim from Berkeley. The claim there is that the school was, was sexist against women, and yet when you actually go look at the data, uh, most of the departments were actually positively in favor of discriminating against men for women. Why does this show up? There, this is the exploit um, that exists in statistics. It's something that's called Simpson's Paradox which when you disaggregate data, like you've done here, and um, you, so you can break the data down into dif different ways, uh, uh, and you will get one, one, one thing will be implied by the different uh, blocks of data. Okay, but when you appropriately combine the data into proper uh, groups, that effect either disappears or reverses, and so too is that true here. This the um, fourth column down here is if you take these two groups and you combine them into one, which will be the minority composing blacks and others. And the reason you do this is to avoid the, logical, the logically dubious proposition that the whites in Washington state are racist against blacks and whites. They discriminate, the proposition in general is they discriminate against minorities, but they don't, they don't actually they would discriminate against only one subset, curiously enough, the subset of people we're going to talk about, and they discriminate positively in favor of all the other minorities to include, uh, I'm sorry, to imply that they discriminate against themselves. And this is on the same criteria and the same data breakdown that the authors themselves chose and, are, and have proposed. Once you combine minorities and compare that against whites, what you find is that the trend disappears. So, um, uh, prosecutors have chosen uh, their selection criteria, however they do it, 25% of uh, minorities in general uh, for these cases, I'm sorry, 25% of the death penalty cases where it saw it, uh, it that's 25%. That's actually better than if you're, if you're white. But when it comes to the execution, this supposed large disparity of between 16.1 and 12.4%, this appears to a fact uh, to 0.3% difference. It completely evaporates, just as Simpson's paradox implies uh, uh, that it should when chicanery is afoot, or when uh, causal relationships are artificially imposed upon this, the system. In this case, it's to mislead the court, as I mentioned earlier. So that completely dis that completely evaporates, and now you no longer have the logical problem of saying that whites discriminate against themselves but discriminate in favor of minorities, except for blacks. Because the proposition is that the majority is discriminating against the other. Well, there is no one more other in a society 
than the smallest divisions of its minorities. Those are the most othered of all the people. Well, you would think. But here, it would be that uh, the most othered is the second largest group, the second most othered is the majority group, and then the most favored are all of, of the other minorities. Complete gibberish. And there are other problems here. You'll notice that we're talking about 12 people, 4 people, or 13 people. Very small sample sizes. One person difference here, uh, I'm sorry, one or two people difference here will, uh, will cover the entire spread. This is an artifact of a small sample. It's not even a real thing. But even assuming that you want to think that there's a real thing going on here, the proper conclusion to draw from the way that the, these people uh, have done this and the data that they have is that there is no distinction between how whites how white, uh, or I'm sorry, how juries judge the white versus how juries, uh, given the option, judge everyone else. That even though apparently prosecutors do some discrimination, if you want to suppose, juries are the remedy to that. Because even when they're overzealous and wanting to put white people to death, the juries still have this high standard and that falls down. And the much stricter standards about being more sensitive about protecting the minorities they are the truly deserving cases because the juries are saying, gosh, this is a truly deserving case. And my last point is that much of this is, is uh, gibberish anyway because what hypothesis testing is looking for, statistical significance is looking for, is, is whatever it is we're seeing the result of chance alone or some non-chance, some other thing. Well, the one thing that's true uh, is that jury verdicts or anything but chance. It is a contemplative exercise. It is a deliberative exercise. It is a painstaking, tedious, long, drawn out, reflective, contemplative exercise. It's anything but chance. They aren't flipping coins and saying this person lives, that person dies. We don't randomly choose people from the population and say a crime may or may not have happened and you may or may not have done it, but it's just your unlucky day. You get chosen for trial. Let's hope the jury flips the coin and it works out well for you. Uh, that is not how this works. This is all done quite on purpose. It is not only uh, purposely done, it is purposefully done. And it should not be surprising that when you go looking at all the data, all the cases, that what you find is that what you're getting isn't by chance. Because it's not done by law, it's not done by chance. None of it is. This is all deliberate, it's all done on purpose. And this is exactly the result that you would expect from a just society. That whether you're white or black, when you commit the most heinous of crimes and you go before a jury, you will be subjected to the, the, uh, most, to the severest penalty uh, known to our laws, which is the death penalty. Uh, and the long and the short of it is that these lawyers want to chicane their way through the Supreme Court of the state of Washington to get from the court what they can't get from the legislature. Their, their problems should be handled across the street, but of course that's a problem in Washington State because after all, this was brought forward by initiative, which is to say that, that the legislature had its view, but the people disagreed. They overruled the, legislature, overruled the legislature and said, we want the death penalty. If you think that is the wrong decision, the proper place to go is to the people of the state of Washington and to persuade them to change their minds. It is not to walk into court and pervert justice uh, mislead, mislead the justices, uh, and uh, intentionally so. That is not the proper way to do this. Racism is not the explanation. Oh, and by the way, on some of the, actually, I'm not going to go into it. I've already probably, people's, uh, people's eyes, eyeballs are probably already floating. So, uh, you guys have a wonderful day.